are commonly called the wise men. These exotic visitors who came from the east to worship the baby Jesus. Scripture calls them magi, magicians, readers of the stars. I suppose that one reason we call these men wise is that so many, many people who thought they were wise completely missed the birth of the baby Jesus. But the Magi got it. They found their way to the baby and his parents and worshipped the child Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. Walter Brueggemann, the great Old Testament scholar, says that the idea that when the Messiah was born, his birth would be such a grand event, and not just for Israel, but for the whole world, was not original to Matthew. The notion that there would be some rich people journeying all the way to little Israel from the east coming to Jerusalem is the story that Matthew borrowed from Isaiah 60. And Isaiah 60 is a very old prophecy. 580 B.C. old. That's old. The Jews had been sent away to Iraq into exile where they languished for years, a captive, enslaved people, reduced to running errands for their masters for more than a couple of generations. At last, at last, it was exile over, and they made their weary way back to their city of Jerusalem. When they finally pulled into town, though, their hearts sank. Jerusalem, that once golden city, lay in ruins. They had nostalgically remembered their home through rose-colored glasses, but the present reality they found there was far from rosy. Brueggemann described Jerusalem as a disappointing ruin. These weary and now disillusioned folk were the ones to whom Isaiah sang in the passage we just read. And Matthew said that the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born, king of the Jews? Of course, Matthew must have been thinking of Isaiah 60 because Isaiah had told those disheartened Jews so long ago that your city will be rebuilt, kings will come to you, Kings from the east bearing all sorts of tribute. Because once again, you will be a great nation. All of the other nations will look to you in fear and wonder. Israel is once again going to become a great international power. And all those once powerful nations from the east will be knocking at your door, seeking your favor. For Matthew, that's exactly what has happened when these kings from the east come calling to Jerusalem. They also explain why Matthew points out that when King Herod, that present king of Jerusalem, heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. King Herod freaked at the idea of a bunch of royal visitors from the east coming to pay homage to some new king. New king meant old king out. And since this all seemed to be such an eerie evocation of the poem that Isaiah told so many years ago, says Brueggemann, Herod anxiously summoned the Department of Old Testament Study at the local university. And he said to them, tell me about Isaiah 60 about all of these camels coming, gold, frankincense, coming over here to see a new king. Well, those biblical scholars wrote up quite a report for the king. And in effect, they said to him, King Herod, the answer to your question is in the Old Testament, but is not in Isaiah 60. 
Because that text says that Jerusalem will be powerful and prosper, the very center of the world. When you can look around, and this city is pretty shabby, under the heel of Rome, and figure out that that text, Isaiah 60, is not referring to the city we now know. So Herod says, well, do you smart ones have a better text that explains our situation a bit more accurately? And these scholars whose job it was to find just the right text to flatter the king say, well, why don't we try Micah 5, 2 to 4? Because Herod, like maybe most politicians, didn't know much about the Bible himself, they quoted Micah for him. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they shall live secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace, Herod liked this text even less than he liked the first one. The notion that there would one day be a new king, and this king would be born in Bethlehem, a, a place so far as we know that Herod never even visited, really got into Herod's head. And you know what Herod did. He called in those rich visitors from the east with their gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and slyly propositioned them, do me a big favor, would you go on down to Bethlehem, that dirty little place in the town, and find this new king. And then send me back word so I can come and we'll all together worship him, together. It'll be wonderful. Of course, Herod didn't want to worship this new king. He wanted to eliminate him. The rest is history. The wise men headed down to a little town of Bethlehem, home of King David, the little town that the prophet Micah had said would one day have an importance far beyond its size. They found the place, laid their gifts before the manger, and since they were wise, they headed, heeded the warning angel's advice, blew off Herod, and stayed off the interstates on their way back home. What we've got here, says Brueggemann, is a contrast between two very different ways of envisioning God with us. Isaiah 60 says that such power is most likely to come through the powerful. Powerful people in powerful places like Jerusalem. But Micah 5 presents an alternative future. Bethlehem is far more modest a place than Jerusalem. A baby lying in a feed trough is a very different thing and a different way to get things done than through a powerful king on a bright golden throne. Herod's MO was to take decisive action in order to keep things under control. But Micah tells us about a God who slips in at odd times, in odd places, taking the future out of our hands and away from our control. <coughs> Two radically different pictures of how God gets things done. Now, geographically, Bethlehem is only about nine miles south of Jerusalem. Or as Maeka would probably correct this, Jerusalem is only about nine miles north of Bethlehem. These wise men were very wise men, accomplished in their wisdom, proficient in their star reading, and, and even so they nearly missed the birth of the Christ by nine miles. Herod, meanwhile, thought he sat on his throne at the very epicenter of the empire, the center of the universe. But he also miscalculated. 
by nine miles. Now nine miles isn't that far, unless you're walking it, or bouncing on the back of a gavel, or trying to find God. And then those nine miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem can be a very, very long way. What if those Bible scholars hadn't remembered Micah and instead stuck with Isaiah? What if they had told the wise men to hang out there in the capital waiting for some really important royal event to occur? they would have missed the Christ child altogether. They would have erroneously thought that their fate, their prestige, their control lay in the hands of purportedly powerful people like Herod. So what's the message behind these wise men? If we're honest, you and I would probably have to admit that most of us misunderstand and miscalculate the promises of God by at least nine miles. We scour the newspaper to see that what some Herod is doing in Washington, Jerusalem, or London. We hop online for up-to-the-minute updates. There's not much news from Bethlehem as reported in the New York Times. We want to be in control. We want to be accurate in our calculations in order to keep our personal world stable just as it is with us on top. One might think with all the violence and chaos in our world that we might intuitively sense that we are not in control, not on top. But that's a very hard nine miles to travel. And to feel, too. Always has been. Always will be. And so as we set off on this New Year journey, I invite you to begin it with a nine-mile trip from palace to stable. From domination to vulnerability. From foe royalty to real deal king from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And there, there to meet God in the flesh. If you do, I can guarantee that like those wise men, you will not go home the same as you came. Amen.